Welcome to the My Tech Tool Belt Podcast. We're your hosts. I'm Shannon. And I'm Brenda. And this is a podcast where we highlight educators who innovate, engage, and inspire through the use of technology. Thank you so much for joining us today for episode 31 of the My Tech Tool Belt Podcast. Today, we have a very special guest with us, Luis Perez, the Technical Assistance Specialist for the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials. Luis shares with us his incredible story about how he became interested in accessibility for all learners. We know that after you hear this episode, you will have a more enlightened view of all your students and look forward to what works best for each individual. Now this will be a multi-part series, so look forward to more episodes on accessibility in upcoming podcasts. So without further ado, our interview with Luis Perez. We are recording uh, a very special series of episodes on assistive technologies in uh, education, and we have a very special guest with us today. Uh, we have Luis Perez. He is a technical assistant specialist at the Ames Center at CAST. More importantly, he is a friend of the My Tech Tool Belt podcast. We met at the ISTE uh, 2018 mm-hmm. conference. Um, he was uh, the TED, one of the TED Talk speakers, and we were so excited to literally kind of bump into him and say, hey, you want to be a guest on our show? And, <laughs> and we made that happen. So welcome, Luis. Yes. Well, thank you. It's, it's great to be here. And that's how things happen sometimes. Uh, it, you know, it was fate that brought us together. I think it was on the exhibit floor. It was. We ran into right. each other. <laughs> it was. And then right. we uh, will post our Twitter. <laughs> we tweeted about it and we Instagrammed it, I'm sure, because we took a photo with you. So we were so happy. And you, um, I want to kind of kick kick us off with this with this episode. I, we're going to talk about assistive technologies with you in the in the content today. And we have a couple other episodes down the pipe that we'll talk about later on in the episode. But you gave this amazing TED Talk, which really inspired uh, Brenda and I to, had we not run into you on the exhibit floor, we would have hunted you down you and, <laughs> and introduced ourselves <laughs> to you anyway. Um, but could you tell us a little bit about that process and that experience for you? Because that must have been very surreal. It, it was really surreal. I, I've never uh, presented in front of that many people. And it was just, it's actually, uh, I should probably mention, first of all, that I am visually impaired. Um and so in some ways that helped me because when I came <laughs> out, I couldn't see how many people there were Only in the audience. Only 22,000 or something. It was, it was nothing. <laughs> so it was, it was helpful to me, but I could feel definitely the, uh, you know, the warmth in the room and I could feel the, the sound and everything. And so um, as you're waiting backstage, it um, doesn't quite hit you until you're in front of so many people and you have to deliver this presentation. But it, you know, it was a process leading up to that point. Um, one day I received an email from ISTE uh, with this uh, message, you know, ISTE, TED, uh, all good things in the subject line. So I continue to read on, to read on. And uh, basically they were inviting me to take part in a pilot for a TED Ed class where um, as an educator, I would learn how to tell a story uh, in the format of TED. And so over the next um, 12 weeks, I basically participated in a course with another ISTE leader, and the two of us kind of bounced ideas off of each other. It was very collaborative, which I think is really important. Uh, Sometimes when you're in the middle of preparing a presentation, uh, you kind of have these blind spots. Mm -hmm. Uh, In my case, they're literally blind spots, (laughs) but, you know, for other people, you, you get so close to the content that it's hard for you to kind of step back and... Uh, take a critical look at it. So I think having another collaborator, another educator look at things was really helpful. And so then um, the final assignment, the homework, if you will, (laughs) was to record myself delivering the script that I had developed. And then I sent that in. And a few weeks later, just actually two weeks before the ISTE conference, I found out that I had been selected to lead off one of the mornings. Uh, along with two other educators. So every day there was a different educator that kind of led off that morning's program with a similar, you know, 12 to 15 minute TED talk. And so mine was on the second day. And uh, like I said, it was a little surreal, but um, I can't tell you as soon as I stepped off the stage, I just took a deep breath and I was like, oh, it's over. 
<laughs> there was so much, so much anticipation leading up to it, but I, I think it went well. And uh, uh, anybody can access it now on the ISTE website. Um, it's available to the public, uh, so you can get a, a chance to see it there. It was amazing. So if if any of our listeners did not, you know, get to make it to ISTE, we talked about it in our ISTE recap episode, how inspiring that was, your talk was, and then meeting you afterwards was really a, also a, just an amazing opportunity and a blessing for us. And then you wrote about the experience too. Is that available on the ISTE website or is that somewhere else? No, it's available on the ISTE website. So most likely the easiest way to get there because it's a big website yeah is to just do a search for Ted and my name, and that should be the first thing that pops up. Excellent. So I, Makes I, it easy. I talk a little bit about the process, um, you know, how I got selected, and then, you know, the importance of having that educator be part of the process with me as well. That was really valuable. And that's something that I'll come back to in the course of this podcast. But I think when it comes to assistive technology and accessibility in general, a lot of times we get overwhelmed because we think we have to know it all. We have to be an expert at everything. And that's just not possible with, you know, the wealth of technology that is out there. So you should definitely sort of build a team and be very collaborative about it. And what I do is I know different people with different backgrounds and that have different expertise. So for instance, I'm not an expert at communication and using alternative communication devices and software. But I have friends who are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so when that question comes up, I know that I can go to them or I may not be an expert at, I don't know, maps, maps and accessibility. That's a question that I got recently. But again, I know somebody who is. And so the more that you can build your network, you know, the stronger you will be as an educator. Anybody who knows me very well will, with it, I get asked a ton of questions all the time on because they think I'm just like know everything from building, <laughs> like literally building a network network, an internal <laughs> infrastructure network to like software and hardware. And so my response is I know a guy because <laughs> over the course of the last 15 years, I built these relationships with people who are my guys and gals, you know, but my, my saying is I know a guy. So if, if I don't know it, like you, I've built that, that we build that network and you are my assistive technology guy. Right. Like you're my guy <laughs> that I would go to and say, Hey, um, well, well, and I always tell people, um, because a lot of times I'll get questions over the internet mm -hmm. and as much as I would want to answer them, um, I always tell them like, when you call your doctor, right, you try to get to a specialist. You don't, you don't want to ask the foot doctor, what's wrong with your heart? Right. Or the heart doctor, what's wrong with your foot? They may be able to give you some general guidance. Right. But um, so generally, when people contact me like that, I always tell them, uh, well, first of all, you have to know the student. You need to know um, their strengths, their weaknesses. You need to know where they're going to be using the technology. Uh, so the context is really important. And a lot of that is not often possible over the internet. That's something where you have to go out you have to observe the student. You have to learn more, a little bit more about the context. So one uh, framework that I'm actually going to be presenting on very soon that I encourage anyone who's interested in assistive technology to check out, it's the SET framework. And it stands for S-E-T-T. -T, and it's Student, Environment, Task, and Tools. And I think it's an assistive technology framework that was developed by my, uh, my friend and colleague at the uh, National AIM Center, where I work, Joyce Avala. So if you go to joyceavala.com, you can uh, find out all about that framework, and you can find out um, there's a number of scaffolds that you can use there to kind of go over each one of those steps of the set framework. But it's, it's really foundational to the consideration of assistive technology, uh, because often we begin with a tool first. Um, we go right for sort of the bells and whistles, you know, the shiny object, yep, shiny objects. <laughs> the latest and greatest. So in some ways, even though this is an assistive technology framework, it can help you with just technology integration in general to kind of remind you that you need to step back and think about the student, right? And making sure that your feature matching, making sure that the features you've selected and the tools you've selected are the right fit for that student. And then consider where are they going to use it? Are they going to just use it at school? Are they going to use it at home? Does it need to go between both environments? Um, who's going to be there with them when they're using it? Um, and then the task. So you can do a task analysis and see where does this tool fit into those tasks that the student needs to um, complete. So it's really important to kind of take that 
process, you know, beginning with a student and then only at the end that you end up with the tool and that should be collaborative, mm -hmm. right? You get information from different people, you get information from parents, from teachers, from, you know, different environments and so on. So that you build a really comprehensive profile of that student that you can then select the technologies that are appropriate. That student. And I mentioned an example of that in my ISTE talk. Um, I worked with a student named Logan Prickett. So shout out to my friend Logan out Logan. there. <laughs> uh, Logan, um, you know, has significant disabilities that impact his vision. So he's considered legally blind. He has motor uh, difficulties and also speech. So, you know, it'd be a difficult situation to, to try to find a tool for him. And the first day that I met with him and his family, I show them a few tools and then we kind of step back and we decided uh, to ask a quick question. What is the one thing we want Logan to be able to do when we're done today? And the one thing that he wanted to do more than anything was to make a phone call by himself mm, wow. on his phone. Now, that's something that most of you that are listening probably take for granted. And I'm sure at some point that was something that came really easily to Logan. But, at, you know, at that point in his life, that was something that he depended on other people to be able to do for him. And so that, that became the driving question was, you know, Logan is, um, we thought about how tech savvy he was and how he liked using his phone. So that became sort of the cornerstone of his communication system. And then uh, by using that process, I was able to, with a team, right? We worked with the team because we needed engineers, we needed designers. We developed a system that allowed Logan to communicate independently and be able to participate in his education uh, on his own terms. So I didn't do it for him. I just created the tools and created the process that empowered him to be able to do what he, what he wanted to do. So that's really what's about. It's really providing those tools that empower learners to accomplish their goals on their own terms. You, you said it so beautifully because it's, and, and I think that's why this is a multi-part uh, podcast series that, that we wanted that was so important for us to run. And, and it was an idea that we kind of came to you with and said, hey, this is kind of what we want to do. And you've, and you've, you've helped us kind of synthesize into three buckets, if you will, um, content. And then we talked about the kind of the hardware and software pieces of it. And then pe pedagogy, the right pedagogy. pedagogy and understanding how you bring all of these things together. And so those are the three buckets that we are going to be looking at over the course of uh, this, this episode series. So thank you for kind of framing it for us. Cause I, like you said, we can't, this would be a, you know, an eight hour show, I think if we, <laughs> if we really sat down and, and talked about it. So breaking it up into these, these nice chunks um, I think is, is helpful. One of the things, Luis, that, that, that we talked about was really kind of helping us understand the, the terms and the definitions that we'll be using throughout the course of this, uh, this series of, of podcasts. And so we talked um, specifically about, you know, a couple, but if you could start with like UDL and then kind of work your way through some of the important kind of bigger ideas before we get into the meat and potatoes. Yeah, you, you can think of this um, episode as sort of providing you with a graphic organizer, if you will, for the series in, in the sense that we're going to define some terms because some of them may not be familiar to you. And then um, I like that, you know, in my work, that's the way that I think. I think about those three buckets. More importantly, I think about the center. So if, I, if you think about it as a Venn diagram, mm -hmm. uh, my goal is to aim for that sweet spot in the middle where the three of them come together. because um, the three, when they come together in synergy, are way more powerful than any one of them individually. Absolutely. Uh, so it's it's the key, you know, to leveraging these um, these frameworks. It's really thinking a little bit more holistically. So uh, the first one is, although you mentioned the last, I usually start with it. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so, so so the first one, because I think it's sort of the overall overarching framework, is um, universal design for learning or UDL. And um, I happened to work uh, at the place where UDL was uh, started way back in the early 1980s and then going into the 90s and to today. Um, so UDL, or Universal Design for Learning, is really a framework for uh, designing inclusive learning environments. Um, and the idea is that um, it's not about special education students or students with special needs or whatever term you want to use. It's about variability. It's about the fact that we all vary. We all are on a continuum. 
So a, a book that I would highly recommend to anyone who wants to sort of explore this idea within the broader context of education is the uh, the end of average. Yes. By Th- by Todd Rose, and you know he talks about there's variability in the physical world, right? So we all comes in you know in different shapes and sizes, and if you eat like me, definitely in different sizes. <laughs> I, I, I love good food. So there's variability that we can see in sort of the natural world, but there's also variability that we can't see until now, right? Now we have the technologies that allow us to see the human brain at work. And we can see that variability where you expose people to the same stimulus. And yet in each person's brain, the patterns of activation are very different. And so um, instead of sort of putting people into categories or assigning them labels, we need to understand that idea that we all sort of vary. And then also that context is very important. So I could be strong in one thing in one context, and then that could be a weakness for me in a different context. And we've always uh, probably as educators know that student who in certain settings, he's um, sort of really well behaved and is on task. But then if you put him in a different setting, he's the opposite of that (laughs) (laughs) or she, it could be he or she. So you know, it's, it's kind of universal design for learning starts from that premise of recognizing that context plays a role in learning. And then variability is sort of, it's just a natural uh, factor when it comes to how we learn. So we won't, don't all learn the same way all the time. And so what that means is that there's a set of three overarching principles. There's uh, multiple means of engagement. So we're all motivated by different things and in different ways. Uh, multiple means of representation. We all take information in and make sense of it in different ways. So we need to teach with multiple modalities. And then we all um, are able to act on the environment in different ways. And so we need to provide students with different ways that they show their understanding. Uh, So again, variability is in all three of those, right? And I think uh, one myth that I would like to dispel is that idea of learning styles, though. Uh, so if you're not familiar, this is a, a kind of a theory that's been around for a long time. You know, the idea that you're a visual learner, right. so we're just going to give you visuals or you're an auditory learning learner. So we're going to sit you down with all your books all day. The fact is that we're multimodal learners. Mm-hmm. So the more modalities, the more options we provide, the more choices, uh, the better it is. There's more entry points to learning. So that's really the core of universal design for learning is the idea of options of choice. You probably heard it referred to as voice and choice. Voice and choice, yeah. Well, uh, we add one more thing to make it universal design for learning. Okay. And that's the idea of accessibility. So if all of those choices are not accessible, then you're not really providing much of a choice. <laughs> for some people, it will be a false choice. You're going to say you can pick from A, B, and C, but if A, B, and C don't work for you, then you really don't have a choice. Right. That makes sense. So, so, so accessibility is key. It's, it's at the core. Um, it's We like to say in the UDL world, it's essential but not sufficient. So it's essential in the sense that it's sort of the, it opens the door for all learners to take advantage of the curriculum. But you then need to bring in some higher order skills as well so that, you know, they're being engaged at a higher level. They're being able to make meaning at a higher level. Uh, essentially, they're becoming experts at learning as opposed to just experts at knowing, experts at learning. Beautiful. That's what we want. That's what we want every kid to have, right? Every Exactly. Every, every kid, and, and you said it beautifully, like every child, every scholar is on a different you know, on a different place, on a different playing field. They're not, everyone doesn't learn the same. And we talk about this when we do blended learning as well, is if I just get up there and teach a full lecture, I'm reaching maybe 50% of my student population. I'm definitely, I might not be reaching my ELs who have, you know, no concept of the English language yet, or there's not, they've not mastered it yet. And then I might not be reaching my kids who don't just don't understand the concept. Either, <laughs> or they're bored because they already know the concept so well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, right. so that we usually say, you know, that fifty to sixty percent is really the only students I'm reaching. Whereas when we think about UDL and kind of take it out of a you know a special ed model and just apply it to all learners, it's every kid, every scholar, every student can benefit from a from this universal design for learning. 
and and I love I love your terminology. Every kid, every scholar. So what if we thought of every kid as an emerging scholar? Uh, everyone, they are, they are, and <laughs> and the framework that goes around just that vocabulary is is uh, that that comes from I think Kip the Kip program. You know where they call the students scholars so that they thrive for that. And I think there's something to be said about that too because it empowers them in in that learning as well. You said something else though the the learning learning styles myth and I and I like that you said that because I've always thought of myself as an auditory learner and I I consume tons and tons of information in audiobooks and podcasts and um and I can do that while I'm driving and I can retain that information and I can pretty much recall which book I've end of average Todd Rhodes Rose I I listened to that one two years ago I can tell you it's on my Goodreads <laughs> list um, I'm just an avid consumer via audio however when I'm planning something out I need to see it I need to put up sticky mm-hmm. notes and big things and I need to I need to draw it um, so then I'm a visual learner so you you said something that just really makes sense is that I'm multimodal I'm multimodal is that what you called it multimodal <laughs> Yeah, multimodal learner, yeah. and then and again, you just indicated that the context makes a difference, right? Exactly. So, audio is the right tool for when you're learning in your car, and we don't want Shannon looking at the screen at that time. <laughs> Definitely not, or on my bike. <laughs> right. Um, well, what I found is like with audiobooks, I can learn if it's a fiction, a work of fiction, mm-hmm. where it's really kind of engages me and it's very immersive, and the language is really descriptive then that can work for me. But um, I try learning uh, the history of the CIA. Mm. Um, that's what my undergraduate degree was in, is in political science. Okay. And um, I got to tell you, if you try to read that book as an audiobook, <laughs> it will be the best cure for insomnia ever. <laughs> don't, about, don't read and drive that book. <laughs> yeah, about 10 minutes into it, I was fast asleep. And, and it's because of the nature of the content mm-hmm. too. So that content is heavy on dates, heavy right. on timelines. And so in that situation, yes, I could consume it in audio, but it helps to have some visual that kind of provides some landmarks and some guideposts. And so, um, you know, we started with the first bucket, right? So the first bucket is that pedagogy, that idea of designing the learning environment to be flexible uh, and to allow learners to have multiple options, accessible options, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so then into that, we can bring in the tools and that can be software, can be hardware. It can also be a learning management system because mm-hmm. a lot of us are doing blended learning and online learning. And so that's a big way that we deliver the content. And then the last thing, as you probably guess, is the content. And the content is king is one of the sayings that I've heard, right? So just like with this podcast, right? There's our content. And then there's the way that you're going to consume it. That could be an MP3 player. That could be your computer. And that computer, if if you can't get to the podcast, right, if you can't navigate to where this audio file is in some accessible way, then it breaks down. Right. And so the, to- the tools, the content, and the pedagogy, they all need to work sort of hand in hand in hand. Um, and it's really that, you know, that, that middle, that sweet spot that we're going for where they all support each other. Now, one one myth that I've heard with Universal Design for Learning is you don't need the latest technologies to implement it, right? Because it's all about thinking creatively and offering options. So for instance, you could use manipulatives in a math class and that doesn't take a lot. You can go to the dollar store and get some things that you can use for that. Um, But I've always felt, and, and maybe this is my bias as a technologist, that part of developing expert learners is developing expert learners for the future. Right. And technology is going to be a big part of that. And so I've always felt like it, it has to be in some way be considered as part of UDL. If you want an expert learner that's prepared for the future of work, then I feel like that has to be part of it. But also technology makes the implementation of UDL in some ways easier because um, it, it gives you options. Like, for instance, on my e-reader, I can change the text size. I can change the background. I can turn on text-to-speech. Uh, with highlighting. Mm -hmm. Those are just preferences that I can turn on. Uh, The content's the same. It's just that I'm personalizing it for for myself. And I think we'll explore that even more, uh, you know, future episode. We'll look at some of the tools. Um, But again, you know, the the two need to work hand in hand. They need to be in harmony, the, the content and the delivery mechanism, if you will. Luis, do you think that 
technology has changed the way that that students and and educators can make materials accessible, right? I mean, it really is a huge game changer. And I think, I, I don't know, I saw it, I saw it as an education technologist happen with the iPad. Uh, when yep. the iPad kind of came into the scene, I felt that that was one of the, that was a catalyst for, in my, in my head, that was when I became aware of assistive technology. And I, and I don't know, what's your take on that? Well, I am right there with you. <laughs> okay, good. I, uh, I feel like I'm in good company though. Thank you for affirming. <laughs> Well, you know, what I think the iPad did is that, um, you know, prior to the iPad becoming sort of a mainstream success, assistive technology used to be specialized, used to be sort of really expensive, difficult to learn. And then here comes the iPad and all of a sudden people are using it as a communication device. And they're using this $500 tablet to replace dedicated devices that were eight to $9,000. Right. Well, now on the iPad, I can put two or three different apps depending on what the student needs. So it, it gave that flexibility. But here's what was really key to it. It's a remove the stigma of using assistive technology. Um, and I heard this so many times when the iPad first came out. Um, now the kid with a disability was the cool kid for the first time. Right. <laughs> he had something, he or she had something that all of the other kids wanted to see. Hey, what's that? You know, you know, so that that was really exciting to me uh, because uh, we all know when there's stigma around a tool, a popular saying that I've heard is some kids would rather uh, do without than stand out. Mm -hmm. So they, they will pass on tools that will probably change their lives because um, especially when you're a teenager, uh, I'm a parent of a teenager, mm -hmm. so I know how strong peer pressure is. And so. If, if it's something that's going to make you stand out, then you're not going to be likely to use it and use it long term. So I think that's really, um, you know, obviously the iPad is really powerful. It has a lot of um, different tools built into it. But I think it, it all comes down to that, that piece of around stigma, like removing that stigma all of a sudden around the tool. And I think more and more students now that that iPads are readily accessible, and I know we'll talk about this in our kind of our hardware and software episode, but like devices are now one to one. So no one really has to know who's right. using what assistive component in their learning. And I, you know, I know that there's there's my child in his class, well, not a lot of his peers know that what kind of he's accessing via his computer that we have set up for him based on his own learning style. And I've shared that with the teacher and she's like, this would be great for another kid in his class. And, <laughs> you know, and I was like, you know, that's the, that's the, where we can really break down walls and move learning forward. I think for, for every child, because just because, you know, my kid doesn't qualify for an IEP doesn't mean that he couldn't benefit from those types right. of technologies. Right. And, and so why would we not allow him to be using or, or, you know, anybody's child to be using these pieces to help them learn. Right. Or the whole class. Or what? Well, yeah. Hello. <laughs> right? I mean, text, text to speech is, is great if they all have earbuds, but speech to text could get really crazy in a classroom. Right. I've seen yeah. that. I've seen that go a little while. So we, we kind of only use those, those ones at home, but. Well, I, I do demos and that's my favorite part of the demos. You know, when I do presentations is when everybody figures out where the text to speech is. And right. then we hear all the different voices and, different accents and so on. But, um, uh, you know, I, I think a key thing that I wanted to mention too is like, uh, how, what if we reframe how we talk about these tools? Mm -hmm. Because we've always said they're accessibility features. And in reality, what they are is personalization tools. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. We could, and and again, get, going back to that, that idea of we are all on the spectrum, right? We're all unique and variable and so each person needs to change the screen. You know, we change the wallpaper, mm -hmm. we change the screensaver. So why not change the display? Why not change the text size? Why not use text-to-speech? That's what works for you. That's your preference. By all means, go for it. And I love how Microsoft, for instance, they call their options learning tools. Ah, oh, beautiful. Because that's what they are. They are They're right. tools that are there to support your learning. Right. I think that's why I said just offer it to the whole class. Everybody don't, should have right? it. Right? Yeah. Don't. Yeah. Don't, don't limit don't it. Single out right. just kids or who, the kid whose mom happens to work in technology and knows that her <laughs> his, his Chromebook can do this. Like that's not that's not fair to the other kids. Right. And so I mean I I I feel like you're right. We should just off. It should just be kind of like. But 
you know, that there's a learning curve on the teacher's part. She sure. didn't even know that we could do that. How sure. how disruptive could it potentially be, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's it's just a learning tool. All of these things are learning tools. And that's I think that's fantastic. Okay, so let's talk about content. Because yes. you you said it best is that all of these things, the tools are the tools are great, uh the, the hardware and software is great, but nothing in my opinion, is more important than what we put into it is the is the actual content of it. And and when you when you made reference to that Venn diagram, I drew it, and it looks a lot like you know TPAC uh, that that TPAC <laughs> model um, that you know we we teach in in education technology these days. So you know I I, I keep thinking about it. it's, it's understanding you have to have the content, you have to have the pedagogy, and you have to have the technology, and that's uh, all of those things kind of coming together make that make that magical. But if your content is weak and not rigorous and, you know, not able to work for the system that you're trying to plug it into, uh, it doesn't really matter what those other two things <laughs> exactly. do because, you know, it, it, it would be pointless. So kick us off with that, with the content piece. So you, get us started on that conversation. Well, first of all, you're very astute to pick up on the TPAC. Um, I know a guy who's writing an article on <laughs> TPAC and and sort of accessibility and how these things fit into it. But um, definitely, uh, you know, there's those connections there. And uh, when it comes to content, so I work for the National uh, AIM Center at uh, the CAST. And so um, I want to AIM EM, so it's Accessible Educational Materials. So it's important to sort of describe or define what that is. So AEM is basically, it goes back a little while now. Um, under IDEA, which is the special education law, there was a system that was set up uh, so that students who struggle with print, they could get materials in alternative formats. And there's four formats, Braille, large print. So if you have low vision, you might need things in large, audio, and then digital text. So this came about in the early 2000s with, you know, when the special education law was sort of updated. Uh, but times have changed, of course, and technology has evolved. So originally, you know, that system was sort of set up to retrofit print. So that would work for students, you know, who, who could make use of standard print. Well, now in the classroom, we're more and more teaching with digital tools, uh, whether it's eBooks, podcasts, Hopefully this one, right? Yes, this one will be an assigned <laughs> listening to my students. <laughs> so podcasts, videos, digital courses, online courses, all of these like different tools have opened up so many possibilities. And so AIM, it used to be AIM, Accessible Instructional Materials, and it evolved into AEM, which is more of an umbrella term, and it covers both print and digital. And so that's what I'm really excited about, the possibilities that, you know, digital brings with it. But there is a misconception sometimes, and I've heard this a lot of times, so I want to clear it up. Born digital does not mean born accessible. That's absolutely right. <laughs> so you can make a digital resource that has just as many barriers as the print counterpart sure. if you don't think about accessibility uh, from the start. Uh, the best example is a PDF. So you could scan a book and make it into a PDF. But if when you do that, you don't check the box that says recognize the text mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, uh, you know, text to speech can read it out loud to an English language learner or to a student who has low vision or just a student who needs that modality, right? They prefer that modality. If you don't take the, you know, the 30 seconds that it takes to check that box, then you might as well be handing that student who needs that support a blank sheet of paper. Right. <laughs> so it's important to sort of consider accessibility from the start so that born digital actually does mean born accessible. And, and um, that box, is that the OCR optical? Something? Yep, op optical character recognition. So basically it goes through and using some fancy magic, <laughs> digital magic, it recognizes the edges of the letters and then it turns it into text that you can, uh, in some cases, edit or at the minimum, be able to listen to it uh, read aloud with text-to-speech. I think and that's, that used copy to be it as well. Yeah, I, that used to be expensive, as I recall. When, when, I, when I, again, I mean, I'm talking 15 years ago when when I was just kind of getting into this field and I can remember 
like, oh, if you want that, you have to pay, you know, $200 extra for this piece of software. And I was like, nah, I'm not going to need that. <laughs> but now it's, it's, it's almost built into just about everything that we, that the, like the scanning programs that we use on our mobile devices. I, I think it's just built yeah. in. Yeah. I got to tell you, you know, a few years ago, I bought uh, this nifty scanner mm-hmm. that I thought I was going to use all the time. It was going to be a great investment. It's in some box somewhere collecting <laughs> dust. <laughs> Because, because your phone does it, your iPad does it. Yeah, my phone does it, and it's it's flexible. I can do it in different places, and um, I don't lose that scan. I can you know upload it right to the cloud. So um, if you want to explore a great app, Office Lens mm. from Microsoft, yes. it's a great free app on iOS. I think it's only on iOS. I would have to check on that, but I use it on iOS in any case, and it allows you to take a piece of text scan it, do the OCR, and get the text-to-speech and, you know, all kinds of, as we said, personalization options um, for text size and so on. So that's that's the beauty is that this stuff is getting smaller, lighter, easier to use, cheaper. Free, it's less, uh, free. Yeah, free. You can't beat that. That's oh, in the budget, right? Free is about as good as a teacher <laughs> can, can ask for these days. And, 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 and anybody, a parent... Um, I've recommended actually Office Lens to uh, you know this the senior couple that I that I do some you know technology work with up the street from me. They, they got these iPhones and they they want to do different scanning things. I'm like, you don't need to go back home and do you know print this or whatever you have. And then the text to speech magic that we can make things happen for them. And 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 again, uh, se- seniors just who have a harder time seeing, they need to order large print books or things like that. They can do that all on their e-readers now. Well, and and, and if we think about, often we think about disability in terms of one particular group of persons right. that we've met, but you know there are people with disabilities we don't see. Yes. They're invisible disabilities or hidden disabilities. There are people that have temporary disabilities in our classrooms. The broken arm is the most common one. The eye infection. True. Is the other one. There are kids who are homesick who may need some supports, you know, to access the information in a different way. And then every single one of us, unless you've discovered the fountain of youth, we're all getting older. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so our eyes are not as sharp as they used to be. Our hearing is not as sharp as it used to be. And then I think the, the biggest impact uh, on accessibility is that mobile. So when mobile devices, we're all in some ways disabled. Because um, we may be using the technology in the car where our attention is not optimal. Um, the sound may not be optimal. We may be using it out in public. We may be using it in bright lighting. And so um, what I encourage people to think about accessibility not as something that is for people with disabilities, but as something that is just good design overall. Because it's flexible design that works in a range of different environments and for a range of different people. Right. Absolutely. And I love the fact that you don't really break down all of these accessibility options by uh, quote unquote disability. It's just like whoever needs it, it's available. Well, and, and at the AIM Center, we, we really espouse um, a functional definition of accessibility. So it's not what label you have, what group you belong to. It's more what do you want to do? So can you see it? Can you hear it? Can you interact with it? Uh, rather than I am a person with a visual impairment, I'm a person with a hearing impairment. It's it's really about the function that the content is performing and what you want to do with it. Um, so, you know, in light of that, if you want to get started with creating accessible content, it turns out we're doing an online course at the AIM Center, and it's in the budget because it's free. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, it, it is a, um, it, right, part of it is synchronous, part of it is asynchronous. Okay. So it, it's a five module course and each module covers a different topic within um, accessibility aimed at classroom teachers. So for instance, right now uh, we're on module two that covers accessible documents. The next module is gonna look at video and how to use video in the classroom and how to do it in an accessible way. And we're gonna look at um, specialized formats. So that's more, you know, I, I would say aim classic, if you will. So how do you get alternatives for print and then finally, we're going to end with digital materials. So this is going on till early 2019. So you have time Great. because um, each module is spread out over seven weeks. It's asynchronous except for the um, kickoff for each module. But then we record that and we make it available on our website. 
And then if you complete a pre and post survey, you can actually get a um, certificate that you did that module. Cool. Nice. I'm in. I'm going to do this. <laughs> I want to be, I teach graduate students, right? I mean, I teach in teacher preparation um, and I teach graduate students going and getting their credential and their master's degree. And I teach the technology courses and, and I know that they're, they, they have other courses that they used to have available to them, but I don't think they do anymore on assistive technologies. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I'm, but I cover UDL and different things in my course. My course is fully online and I know that I could do a better job of modeling what this is. I just don't know where to start. So if any other teachers or higher ed professionals, high school teachers uh, who want to do a better job, they could go take this course, right? Yeah, they can take this course. Um, if you want to see UDL model, we've modeled it on sort of, there's three entry points. You could do uh, entry. If you're just brand new to the topic, you can do uh, build. So you have some familiarity with it, but you just want to get better. And then proficient if you're an overachiever and you want to sort of take it to the next level. Uh, so again, that's the flexibility of UDL. And of course, we use a variety of different you know, videos, different resources. Along with that, on our AIM Center website at aem.cast.org, we have a module called Designing for Accessibility with Poor. And um, there are standards for accessibility, but they tend to be very dense because they're aimed at developers and techies like us, as opposed to classroom teachers and people that, you know, accessibility is not their primary job. Their primary job is to teach <laughs> and, and to think about those things. And that's good, right? Not every, you can't do everything, right? right, right. So, so what we've done is we've taken the standards and we boil them down into some very simple practical tips, things you can do on Monday to take that Word document and make it more accessible so that it works for all of your students. Uh, take that PowerPoint presentation and make it more accessible. Or your social media, you know, adding descriptions is possible now on social media so that everybody can participate in the conversation. So it's, it's very much oriented around, well, here are these four big principles, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And if you focus on those big principles, then you're going to end up with materials that um, not only work for more students, but work on more devices and in more places. And so they're just better materials all around. Um, so again, you can, you can find that on our website. It's called Designing for Accessibility with Poor, which is the acronym that those four concepts form. So you can pour the accessibility into everything you do. You are poor. <laughs> exactly. Got it. And, and so, uh, so let me ask a question because, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to speak just as an, as an educator. I'm, I'm going to wear my educator hat here is that, you know, like I said, I think I can do a better job. I don't, I, I don't, I don't have, um, so for example, like this, this, uh, if we were to make this into a video, if this was a video, there's got to be tools out there. And I know we'll talk about a tool episode, but like tools out there that like, help us transcribe these things so that, mm -hmm. um, you know, someone could read this if they were, if they were hard of hearing or are those resources available? Are you guys kind of providing a, an, an aggregate of like, if I, if I need to do this, these are the tools that can help me do this. And if mm -hmm. I need to do this, these are the tools. Well, guess what, Shannon, you're, <laughs> you're in luck. Am I throwing you some softball? <laughs> it's because it's your lucky day. Because I this was not planned. Seriously, these are like legitimate questions that I have as an educator. No, no, no. This is great. Um, so I, I like to say that um, you know we used to teach the well, we used to teach the print generation and then the YouTube generation. Yep. But we're beyond that now. We're teaching the Snapchat yes. generation they or what's the popular game now? Oh, uh, for, Fortnite. Fortnite. Fortnite, right? So students are demanding more than just something that they sit in front of and just consume. They're demanding things that are a little bit more engaging, a little bit more interactive, um, that it's not just going one way, right? It's going both ways. Um, and so with video, it's always been like pretty passive. And there's things you can do. You can embed questions now. I think there's a tool called Ed Puzzle yep, that it. you can embed questions. Um, the other thing you can do to make video a little bit more accessible is break it down into short segments. Um, because um, I know there's some research out there. I can't quote it off the top of my head, but we remember the beginning and the end of things. Mm -hmm. So if there's a 10 minute video, you're probably only going to remember what's mentioned at minute one and what's at minute 10. 
So one way that we can help with retention is we create more beginnings and more ends. That's true. And the way, and the way we do that is we split it in segments. Right. And so you, you can do that with a YouTube video. You can sort of uh, create a link that points to a specific point in the video. And then um, with regard to the accessibility, I'm going to give you a free tool. Um, it's called Cadet. And it's the captioning and description editing tool. And what that does is it allows you to play the video and then you can type the captions. And when you're finished, you can add the timing. And so that gives you a caption file that you can upload to YouTube, Vimeo, any of these video hosting websites. Or even easier, you can upload the video to YouTube and you can let YouTube do the transcription. But here's the key. You have to fix it. You have to edit, yeah. You have to edit it because the artificial intelligence is just not there yet. It's getting better, I have to say. But it struggles with things like uh, proper names. So Luis Perez, <laughs> right. for instance, I often become a fruit, a pear. <laughs> <laughs> so things like that, you know, it still struggles with. And then also the punctuation. Right. So you often have to go in and put in punctuation. And then also um, identifying the speakers. So letting people know when it shifts, like if you have two people on screen, well, now it's Louis speaking, now it's Shannon speaking and so on. But I say YouTube is probably the, the best place to start because you can do that automatic um, description. Uh, you can then download it and bring it into a tool like Cadet and you can fine tune it and end up with a really good you know, um, caption video. But again, it's important to embed prompts and, and sort of think about chunking that content so that you know, it works for the way that we consume information. And unfortunately, the internet is making us all have ADHD <laughs> in the sense that our ability to focus for long periods of time is becoming less and less. So. Well, and I'm monopolizing the questions, Brenda. I'm no, really that's sorry. Fine. But like, I, I'm going back to, you know, as an educator, I, I want to provide my materials to my students in these in these mul multiple modalities, right? I want to provide maybe an audio file, a video file, a text file, um, and so what I found just as an educator is that I'm I'm giving them what looks to be like a whole lot of information, right? I'm giving them five videos with kind of the the text files or supplemental reading that is basically the same thing as what's being said mm -hmm. in the video and things like that, and that opens a door for I think a more personalized approach to learning, personalized learning, right? As I, what I was trying to impress upon my students is I'm going to give you a lot of information, but you don't have to go through every video. You don't have to read every article. What you need to do is make sure that you're reading the different right. pieces that I'm asking you to read or watch or listen in whatever, whatever your best way is to consume that. But what I'm finding is that they're like, I just read this, I just read this, or I just listened to this, or I just watched this. And I'm like, yeah, but you're only supposed to do one, whichever one works best for you. So <laughs> I'm having a hard time communicating that, that robustness. What's, what are some suggestions that, that I could be better at that? I, I think it's important to sort of scaffold it mm -hmm. and have some pretty clear instructions. So basically try to be as explicit as possible. And then part of it is also like the design. Um, how easy is it to navigate and so on and, and you know indicate where the thing is just an alternative right so it it's just an alternative that if you want to consume it in that format that's what you choose so just having clear directions will help with that the other you know i wanted to address also another misconception because um, i get this a lot in higher education when i uh, first started consulting on udl uh, a lot of teachers thought that they had to do videos all the time <laughs> Or they had to do, everything had to be an image, you know, because right. it's UDL. Right. I'm, I'm like, print is okay. Right. You, you can do print. The, the problem is when print is the only option. Right. And the same thing with lecture. Like, lecture inherently, there's nothing wrong with lecture. The problem is when lecture is the only thing you do. Or writing, right? I know students, I'm me being one of them, I prefer to write. Because that's just the way that my brain works. I have an easier time kind of getting my thoughts down when I can see it on a page. So that's what works best for me. And if you take that option away and then you make it so that every assignment has to be a video, every assignment has to be some sort of multimedia, you're taking away 
something that worked for me. Right. So it's not like lecture is not bad. Print is not bad. Uh, writing is not bad. It's only bad when it's the only option right. we provide students. So in that course, I would say, you know, just make sure that you're explicit as to like what's an alternative and what's there for enrichment. So that's one way that I would uh, sort of explain it is I would say this is background knowledge. Uh, this is must know. Gotcha. So so there's two things that you absolutely need to read because Shannon's going to give you. No, she's not going <laughs> to give you a test. That wouldn't be very UPL, that's but we're going to do something with it. We're going to do something in class They'll just have to, to see. demonstrate mastery of these, t- of these things. Exactly. Yeah. And then there will be a couple of things that are there for enrichment. Mm-hmm. So, you know, some students may get done faster and they may understand the content right away because they've had some exposure to it. So we can say, well, this is for enrichment. This is for you to be engaged or for you to teach it to somebody else. Uh, so thinking about it on those three levels, that kind of gives people different entry points as well. That's perfect. That's I, I, My next round of students will be much happier. <laughs> <laughs> and I might even be able to tweak some of my future lessons. For me, personalizing learning is my is my end game, right? Everything I do is kind of leading up towards this overarching experience that Mm -hmm. I want my students to have, but I also want them to experience so that they can give their own students those options. So I'm I'm really excited to dive into this free course that you guys have and become better at it. And the name of the course again? So if you go on the AIM Center website, aem.cast.org, you'll find it under uh, events. And it's called, I, we couldn't come up with a catchy name. So it's right now the new educator online course, because that's our target audience. Got it. It's uh, people that are either pre-service or just getting started in their career. So um, I think when you're new to education, we have a chance to mold you <laughs> for the rest of your career. So we're trying to get people early in their career so that they these practices be, become part of their core beliefs. Absolutely. That's awesome. And I think it's it fits perfectly with what, what we do in, in my classes as right. well. Right. And and we've been Shannon and I have both been talking extensively about new educators and how it the lack of training that they receive for not only accessibility but so many things. And I think that's why we're trying to actually get this podcast out is sometimes they don't hear about so many tools that they can use in their classroom until they're in the trenches and then mm-hmm. they're like, we're trying to cram so much in teacher right. preparation. Right. I mean, it, and I'm, and I'm defending higher ed in, in that space is just that, that we are trying to get like methods courses and just, we're just, we're just trying to fill them with it. And we don't have enough time. We just, and that's, I think any teacher you talk to, that's what we hear, right? There's just not enough time to teach everything we need them to know. And so, a lot of what gets so I have a, my courses are electives, so they're they're packed. I was just letting Brenda know this year for the first time I have like double the amount of students in a class, and wow. it's, and and which for me is almost thirty. I've never had that many more in a class, but there's there this is the most engaged group I've ever had. They're asking great questions. They're responding intelligently. They're supporting each other when when questions come up, and they're asking for more information on X. Uh, before I even have a chance to go in and respond, they've already put other resources up there. I mean, they're just, uh, what we're seeing, I'm seeing this kind of change over the course of the last five years that I've been teaching these courses, but they still are not, like, I still can't give them everything in the two tech courses that I teach. So, and I'm only- And, and, and neither, neither should you, because um, like um, a doctor doesn't stop learning when they leave med school, right? Right. So- what we can do is give our teachers a good foundation of best practices. And that's really the way that we approach it at the AIM Center is that, you know, the best practices is what's important. Mm-hmm. Um, the tools are going to change, Always. you know, where you mark up a heading and word that's going to change or where you add the alternative text to the image that's going to change. What's important is that, you know, that, you know, those are things that are important to do. And then that that application or some applications have that capability. And then, you know, you can always go on YouTube and find a Absolutely. tutorial. Right. I Google it. Everything we can. <laughs> exactly. And we can Google almost anything That's these right. days. And I think you're, so you're right. Like we, if we could set up foundational practices for them, this understanding of UDL, this understanding of every learner is a unique learner and, and setting up these things um, and where to go to get support, podcasts, 
YouTube, your Twitter network, you know, those Twitter network is huge, huge. And those are places where you and I as educational technologists, that's where we go to find our guys <laughs> to help us with things, right? Like, <laughs> Often within like less than an hour, right? you post a question of practice and you get 15 responses. And there's a good chance that one of those will be the solution that you're looking for. Absolutely. And I feel like if we can just instill those things in our students, they're, they're going to make great educators because they're going to continue to want to learn and explore those things. Uh, Luis, this sort of a question off, a little bit off topic, but so we've talked about uh, instructing the teacher on how to deal with the students. Uh, what about the families? Do you do anything to help support the families? That is, man, you're just teeing it up for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a softball. We're just, we're just throwing these gravies right to you. So um, we actually, one of the things we do, because we have such a big website and sometimes it's difficult to find just the right resource. Um, so we think about it in terms of different stakeholders that are need to be involved in the process. So, for instance, we have um, what are called quick starts. And so, the, for instance, there's a quick start for um, higher ed. So if you're in higher education, that kind of groups our resources, you know, based on your setting and what you need. We have um, quick starts for teacher educators, for administrators. You know, these are all different audiences that may have different needs. And so guess what? We have a quick start for families. Excellent. Nice. And um, we're actually, this as we're recording this week, um, there will be a new version, a new updated version of that based on some feedback that we receive uh, from the public. And so, again, the, the idea there is this is one document, one place that you can go and in a question and answer format, see sort of like the top 10 questions that a parent might have or a family member, because um, we can't forget about the parents. They're a big part of the support network. Um, and in order for us to be successful, we need to work hand in hand. You know, that's why, for instance, the IEP, it's not just one teacher. Right, it's right. a group of people. It's, it's a collaborative decision-making process. And so we want parents, we want family members to be part of that as well. So that quick start should be uh, pretty helpful with that. Basically, we say um, our audience is really uh, womb to tomb or twinkles to wrinkles is another term <laughs> I've heard. So if you're alive and breathing, um, our materials are there for you. <laughs> if you're interested in learning about accessible educational materials, and then, of course, we're part of CAST, the center of what well, used to be the Center for Applied Specialized Technology. Now it's just CAST. Um, and... Um, you know, CAS is where Universal Design for Learning is researched, is implemented. And so we're part of that as well. So you can see how they all kind of come together. AIM is just a small part of creating a curriculum that works for everybody. That's amazing. That's great. What is the kind of the rest of the content pieces that you want to make sure that our, our listeners know and are aware of? You know, we always have events going on. Um, uh, I teach webinars on things like PDF accessibility, document accessibility, those kinds of things. Um, but really that online course, is, it's a good entry point because um, it gives you a sort of a framework for exploring the rest of the resources that we have you know, on our website. Um, it kind of places into a nice sequence, a nice context for you to learn. And so I think the in the next episode, depending on the sequence <laughs> that you access these, um, we're really going to be talking about um, what's beautiful about the, the world we live in right now is that there are tools that cut across platforms. So you're not limited. Oh, I just have an iPad or I just have a Chromebook. You know, there's tools like I mentioned learning tools from Microsoft. You know, that's not specific to a Mac or Windows. Um, it's available across a number of systems. And a lot of these things are fairly inexpensive and really easy to learn, really easy to use. So we'll talk about how those things can be used to support the implementation of um, true voice and choice, right? So not just voice and choice, just you know, sort of a lip service, but making sure that that voice and choice is accessible to everybody. Everybody can benefit from it. Finally, we'll address, you know, UDL in terms of not just what teachers do for their students, but in terms of what teachers do for their own learning. And so that is the focus of a book that I co-written with uh, my friend Kendra Grant. Um, it's a book from ISTE Publishing. You know, it goes into UDL as a lesson planning approach as well. So we take a lesson, we break it apart, 
we look at the materials, the methods, the goals, making sure that you know the goals don't create barriers, all different aspects of designing that lesson to make sure that it works for everybody. But then we also look at the professional learning because if you don't change the professional learning so that it it's based around UDL and it models UDL, it's almost like you're telling people do this, but I don't trust it enough to do it myself. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we try, Kendra and I try to model it throughout the book. And so it's almost, uh, it's like a choose your own adventure kind of book where you can, the metaphor that we use to swimming, which is, this is going to be really ironic coming from somebody who can't swim <laughs> and who's from an island. But our, our whole metaphor basically is you can dip your toes you can go for a shallow swim where there's still supports. So you can always you know, stand up if you get in trouble. Or if you're an expert or a more advanced, you can go for a deep dive okay. you know, once you have the right tools. And so that's really our framework from the book. You can go in through the book in different ways, different paths. So again, that's available from ISTE Learning. And then for the and episode it, and on it, and tools. It, and it's actually called Dive into UDL, right? As I re- that's right. The irony <laughs> there. I saw, I saw what you were doing. I saw that connection. Dive into UDL. Dive into UDL. And uh, the title came to me uh, because I was reading about Michael Phelps. And Michael Phelps actually, I actually met his mom at a conference one time and heard her speak. And he has ADHD. You know, so he's a very successful person, again, in the pool. Right. But in the classroom, he struggles. So, again, that idea of context. Right. He was really successful in one context, but in a different one, he struggled. So that kind of got me in the frame of mind of thinking about swimming. And plus, I was trying to learn how to swim myself, <laughs> which is still an ongoing. I'm trying, to take a, I'm trying to take a growth mindset to it. You're a lifelong learner. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the second book. Um, In in one of these episodes, we'll focus on the tools. And I published a book called Learning on the Go uh, from Cass Publishing. And it focuses on the iPad, but also has um, appendices or uh, additions for Google. So whatever you can do on the iPad, it gives you options for the same tools when they are available on Chromebook or um, other devices. But um, What I wanted to do with that is not focus just on accessibility, but also on creativity. So things like creating a podcast or making a green screen video or um, doing a meme as a way to show your understanding of, you know, the key concepts of a lesson. So it's all part of UDL. UDL, it's, it's all about making learning more creative as well. So that's the way that I look at it. More flexible, but also more creative. And And for every learner. I mean, exactly. So. By design. Well, yeah, absolutely. By design. Intentionally, right? Intentionally doing this to meet every learner's you, needs. Uh, you we got will, it. We will put links to those uh, in our on our website and um, in our show notes. So uh, if they have any, if anybody wants to order those, we'll have those available. We'll also put a link to your website there. And then your your social media handles. How do they, how do they follow you on Twitter? So uh, first, um, the AIM Center. It's uh, really easy. It's AEM, stands for Accessible Educational Materials, and then underscore center. Um, we're also on Facebook. So um, on Facebook, it doesn't have the underscore. So it's just AEM center. Um, you can do a search for us and find us there. And then all of our webinars are up on YouTube. So if you do a search for a national AIM center, you should be able to find all of our webinars, which, of course, are captioned. Because we try to practice what we preach. Now, um, me personally, on Twitter, I'm Ion Access. So E-Y-E-O-N-A-X-S. So X like xylophone, S like Sam. Um, I used to, I try to find Luis Perez, but uh, Luis <laughs> Perez is John Smith in Latin America. So <laughs> good luck with that. And then, um, you know, my TED Talk was all about or in some ways touch on how I do photography as a person who's visually impaired. So if you want to see my photography, um, you can find me on uh, Instagram. It's uh, LFP1211. And uh, I'm pretty close to a thousand followers. Nice. So hopefully let's, let's get you let's, over the edge. I just need like 40 more to get over a thousand. That's a big goal of Ooh. mine. So uh, I'm just issuing a challenge out there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm already a follower. Yeah, we, me too. We, we follow you. Does your center have a hashtag or anything? We do. 
It's um, hashtag AEM, the number four, and then all, A-L-L. And in fact, we're asking people who participate in an online course to use that hashtag to share their insights or things that they've learned, ways that they've used the content that they've got from the AIM Center. Uh, so that's also um, a way to follow us is to follow the hashtag. I'll be, I'll be following that closely. Yes. Uh, one more question for you, which maybe we should have started with <laughs> earlier, but can you give us a background about you and your story and how you got to be where you are today? Oh, how much time do you have? <laughs> no, I'll give you, I'll give you the condensed version. So, um, I I guess the reason why I'm so passionate about UDL is, um, you know, I'm an English language learner, and probably the biggest struggle in my life, people think, is my vision loss. Uh, it's not. The biggest struggle that I had was coming to the U.S. at the age of 11 with not a word of English and going into a public school in New York City and having to learn the language. And uh, if you want to see UDL in practice, uh, I'll give you a show you should look at. It's called Sesame Street. Oh, yes. <laughs> so Sesame Street is the way that I learned a lot of my early basic English that then um, I came to the U.S. during the summer. And then uh, as I went to school that fall, I already had a few words, a few concepts. And that made all the difference to me. So for me, it's it's not about like just about accessibility. It's about the fact that I was an English language learner, and by using different modalities, using you know video, using images, I was able to learn. And then, um, as an adult, I had a career. I was sort of on a certain path, and then I got into a series of car accidents, and all of a sudden, I was diagnosed with a visual impairment, and so I had to recalibrate <laughs> and rethink what I was going to do. Um, interestingly, what really helped me is that I was a techie and I already had some background in accessibility just from being a techie and working in the tech world. And so that really kind of set the stage for my, you know, my next career move, which was um, getting a master's in instructional design with a focus on accessibility and inclusive design. And then my doctorate in special education. And so that kind of brings me to today. I, prior to joining the AIM Center, I was working as a consultant, uh, focusing all three of those areas, those three buckets that we talked about. Uh, curriculum with Universal Design for Learning, assistive technology with the tools, and then, of course, digital accessibility you know, with the content. Um, so everything happens for a reason. You know, Everything kind of brings you to a certain point in life. Um, and it just prepares you for for that uh, mission that, that you have in life, that calling, if you will. Wow, what an interesting story. Yeah, you're exactly where you're supposed to be, <laughs> impacting right. yeah. most likely millions of students. So th thank you so much for doing that and, and taking this on because it's it's huge and, and spreading the word because right. I think there's a lot of us out there in education that know just a little bit. Like, I know, I know how to make this text a little bigger. I know, like, oh, Google has this button now. <laughs> text. <laughs> I can, you know, speech to speech to text. Um, and so, but like, there's so much more to it than just that. And I think that's why we really, we're, we're so happy that you're joining us for these episodes. And you're, and we're so happy that we're able to kind of spread, spread this information and this knowledge out to the, to the greater whole. So thank you so much. And yeah, and you travel around the yes. country, around the world, giving speeches and talking about accessibility. Spreading the word. So um, if you you know if you go to our website, you'll see that we are all over the place over the next few months uh, attending conferences, both in special education and in general education, because we want to cover both um, both audiences. So this is really it's been a pleasure for me. Um, this is you know the kind of audience that we want to reach, and um, I'm issuing an invitation to all of you. Uh, if you've ever you know, sort of been intimidated by accessibility. Uh, what we do at the AIM Center is break down those barriers and make it, you know, easily, make it easier to get started. Well, I, I know that I will be actively engaging more in this in this topic and this conversation just for my own learning. And I will encourage my students and my colleagues and peers to do, to, to do the same. And we're looking forward to talking with you again. Yes. Sounds good. I look forward to it. We feel very fortunate to have met you met and you. bumped oh. into you. And you're, you're, a, you're a friend of the family now, Louise. You're, you're in. You're in. You're in the inner circle. You're in the, yeah, we, we got gotcha. you. 
Well, thank you. Circle so much. of trust. That's right. Circle, Circle of, trust. of trust. You got it. Um, we are. Uh, well, thank thank you again for your time this today, and we we really appreciate it. And we will be talking with you soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Luis. Thanks, Luis. And sure. We're, we're out. out. Thanks for listening to the My Tech Tool Belt podcast. If you have enjoyed listening, please rate us on Apple Podcasts or send us some feedback on our website, mytechtoolbelt.com. We would love to hear from you. This will help us deliver the content that you want to hear. Thanks. And we're out.